Okay, today I'm going to be doing my Australian history assignment and before I start getting into that I thought considering a lot of people who watch my YouTube channel aren't Australian, I thought I'd do a quick rundown of Australian history before my actual start my presentation just to give you a look. In 1788 the British first and the first fleet which is the first kind of colony of Australia which is not the native population. In 1835 John Batman and or John Pascoe Faulkner established a settlement in Port Phillip which is now Melbourne, where I am right now. New Zealand is proclaimed a separate colony, no longer part of New South Wales, which is what Australia was called at the time. 1851, Victoria separates from New South Wales. Also in 1851, the Victorian gold rush starts, and most historians agree that this isn't a coincidence. <clears throat> 1880, the bushranger Ned Kelly is hanged. 1887, an Australian cricket team is established, defeating England in the first Ashes series. 1891, a severe depression hits Australia. 1901, Australia Federates becoming a separate country from Britain on January 1st, so Edmund Barton becomes the Prime Minister. Nation, race and citizenship. Okay, so Australia is now its own separate country, away pretty much from Britain, though it's still Britain still has a lot of influence on them. So this is about nation, race and citizenship, and what was wanted for a new Australia. So my contention for this topic is the experiences of those who are excluded gives a clear impression of who and what Australians thought would constitute the ideal citizen. And I agree with this. Okay, so this goes on to the legislation of the time. What were the main kind of famous pieces of legislation passed in that early time when Australia first became a country which really which really made the country what it was at the time and what they thought the country would become. So the main three pieces of legislation I'll be looking at are the Pacific Island Labourers Act of 1901, the Immigration Restriction Act of 1901, and the Franchise Act of 1901, known as the White Australia Policy. And this is the main thing I'll be looking at in regards to the ideal citizen. Each of these pieces of legislation referred to a specific group of non-British or non-white Australians or those who wanted to become Australian, although but they obviously weren't at the time and probably didn't become Australian. The Labourers Act referred to migrants who were already in the country. The Franchise Act referred to Aborigines and the right to vote. The Immigration Restriction Act referred to non-British who wanted to immigrate to Australia. Aborigines, who were the native populace of Australia, were not considered citizens. As such, they could not vote. This pertains directly to the legislation that was talked about in the Franchise Act. They were subjects of Australia. They were treated as wards of the state. This means that they were treated like orphans, and the state had the final word on anything that happened to them. And this included going into things like the stolen generations were because they were wards of the state the government had the right to steal the children of the um, native population and they were not given the same protection under the law as white Australians. There were the Pacific Islanders too. They were the main immigrant workforce of Australia. They worked mainly in the sugar cane plantations in Queensland where it was really hot and humid and no one particularly wanted to work there because it was pretty unpleasant. They were kidnapped um, and brought to Australia to work in these um, sugar cane plantations and it pretty much wasn't very fair for them overall. They were put on contracts which were about three years in duration and after that they could pretty much do their own thing. But by the passing of the Pacific Islanders Labourers Act, they were pretty much told they had to go away. So they were always reverse kidnapped. They were kidnapped and then taken away and deported. Though many had lives and families, like they had gotten together with Aboriginal women and or some white women, because the workforce was mainly men, as those were the ones who were working, obviously. And they had children and they had started to form actual lives in Australia. New migrants. Many non-British were lured to Australia with the promises of a new life. They were lured by the same propaganda which was being sent out to Britain to try and get people to immigrate here. Many of these people who were lured here who weren't British were from Asia and Europe and by the Immigration Restriction Act of 1901 these people weren't permitted to become citizens. Um, the main measure was the dictation test, which was a test which was about 50 words, or it was 50 words long. 
and it was read out by an immigration official. The person who wanted to become a migrant had to listen to what was said and write down these 50 words. This may seem, yeah, pretty fair, who knows, like they mightn't speak English and we might be supporting an English-speaking country. But this definitely was not the case. The dictation test was set up. It was to keep people out, and that was its main purpose. When the legislation was being discussed, the um, Australian Labour Party, who were the opposition of the Protectionist Party, which was the party that was in power at the time, wanted, simply put, a blatantly told, we are not going to allow people who aren't British and aren't white into Australia. And so the Labour Party talked with Mother England about this, and Mother England pretty much said, no, this is going to really annoy the people who are in the British colonies of India. And it's also going to really annoy the Asian um, peoples of China, who Britain had really strong trade with at the time. So Britain said, you can go along with, we'll go along with your dictation test, but we're not going to allow you to blatantly stamp this out. So there was, and, and the reason why, the reason why the dictation t test was passed was because Australia really feared that England was going to abandon them, and England was their main kind of safety blankie of the time, the one who kind of looked out for them and was still pretty powerful in Australian life and many Australians wanted to still be British. So the dictation test, as I said, may seem fair, but it wasn't. It was in, it could be done in any language uh, that was a European language. There's this one test where this really obscure Celtic dialect was, someone was tested on that and I think they actually passed that dictation test because this man was a multilinguist. But he was then retested in a different language which he didn't speak, which was another thing which was the dictation test which made it particularly unfair. If they didn't want the person to enter the country and they passed the dictation test, they had the right to give this person the dictation test as many times as necessary and, as, and in as many languages as necessary to make sure that they didn't get into the country. And these three groups had a lot of... The old migrants, or the people who had immigrated before 1901 and before this legislation was, pa was passed, had had experiences in the country in regards to building families, to having friendships, to having jobs and stores and lives and working and supporting the country's economy. But they weren't the ideal citizen. They weren't white. A lot of them had accents from whatever country they were or from whatever area they were from. The native aborigines of the country had few rights and this was shown by the Franchise Act, which didn't allow them to vote. New migrants to the country could not become citizens and could not even enter the country to, to try and become citizens. Some of them had experienced extreme hardship in the countries they were from, and still they were not permitted into the country. But you may be wondering, what did the government actually say at the time? What were the thoughts of the people in power? Well, John Forrest, Western Australia's um, Premier of the time, said, it is of no use to shut our eyes to the fact that there is a great feeling all over Australia against the introduction of coloured persons. It goes without saying that we do not like to talk about it, but it is so. We quite... Um, Joseph Chamberlain, the colonial secretary, said that we sympathise with the determination of these colonies, that there should not be an influx of people alien in civilization, alien in religion, alien in custom. Donald Cameron, the member for Tasmania, said, quite contradictory to other things that were said at the time, no race on this earth has been treated in a more shameful manner than the Chinese. They were forced to the point of bayonet to admit Englishmen into China. Now, if we compel them to admit our people, why, in the name of justice, should we refuse to admit them here? But what did this say about Australia and what constituted the ideal citizen? Australia wanted to be the white working man's paradise, a place that people from other countries would envy and that you could escape to and pretty much live the ideal life. It was definitely loyal to the Queen and the monarchy and to England and depended heavily on it for support 
and in regards to a lot of matters from political to economic in regards to trade and as well in regards to defence and the military aspect as Australia was a quite small budding nation. Non-British immigrants in their eyes threatened jobs as it was feared that they would not join unions and be willing to work for less money and in, under worse working conditions than white working class Australians and British immigrants. And that it would affect the overall quality of the nation in regards to social Darwinism, which is a belief system that no matter how you try to educate um, a certain race of people or try to teach them ways of living, that they will be the inferior species and genetically that they are inferior to white people. So it was feared that this would affect the overall culture and if they interbred it would impact severely on the actual quality of the country genetically. To conclude, Australia was a young country that wanted to be seen as utopia, but only for a certain group, which was the white working class man. Sometimes undertones of this dream still show through in modern Australia, but this, we have to realise, wasn't that long ago. This was a hundred years ago, and in terms of nations and views on things, this is a very short period of time. We've grown, um, we are now one of the most multicultural countries in the world, and we'll continue to grow, and over time this hopefully will be just ancient history that um, isn't forgotten but is really truly irrelevant to the Australian culture and the Australian ideal that we see. Um, thank you. So that was my presentation and I hope everyone enjoyed it. There'll be some further information and links that you can follow in the bar below and make sure you thumbs up if you think I should get a really good mark on this. And I'll post the mark I get, um, hopefully, in the comments or in the information section thing below. Cheers.